the foundation of this talk, the presumption of it, is that at some point you're going to talk to someone about peak oil. Now, you might not be on a stage with a, a PowerPoint, right? Perhaps it's just your, your neighbor or a coworker, but at some point you're going to be discussing peak oil with someone, and I'm expecting most of you have been in that situation at least once. Um, so I'm going to try and convey a few tips uh, that, about how to go about that specifically with the idea of destroying complacency because the first step in solving a problem is recognizing you have one. And while that's very clear in this room, uh, I would uh, suggest the majority of the public does not know we have an oil problem other than maybe, you know, it's under someone else's soil. That seems to be a problem. Apathy becomes before calamity in the dictionary. Look it up. I just, I, found, I just did a Google image search on complacency and found this, and, and, and I just loved it. So the first thing is you have to know your audience, right? What are you speaking into? What do they already know? What do they already think they know? What's their mindset about this? Um, you risk, if you don't know your audience, either wasting time covering things that you already have alignment on or talking ahead of where they're at and not really having a conversation of, of any impact. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about graphs and numeracy and photos and different situations where you might use one or the other of those and why. A uh, little warning about the resistance. So the idea that there are limits to growth or limits to anything is not um, welcome in this culture. And uh, I don't expect that to radically change overnight, right? So it may change in a given place or a given room, but it's, it's deep. As our uh, earlier speaker was talking about, 10,000 years of culture, shedding that is, is not an easy thing. Um, as I went through and did talks, I took feedback from my audience uh, perhaps too much. And I'll uh, give an example of, of where I allowed them to sway me, uh, perhaps into ineffectiveness. Um, Avoiding extremes, so I'm going to give some examples of stuff I pulled off the net about advice, you know, what people should do uh, on to extremes. And what I find is there's a lack of a middle in there. Um, that there's really a lot of polarity on the subject. And giving your audience something to act on. It is so easy to come to a presentation and listen and find it very titillating and take a lot of notes that you'll never look at again and do nothing. And then what we might actually be able to accomplish, right? What, what are realistic parameters? Are people going to actually go home and dramatically change their life because they heard a good presentation? Not too many. So back in the 1970s, we had a uh, oil crisis or an energy crisis, as it was called. I was 13 at the time. Um, I was, was good at math and science, and so I declared I was going to solve the energy crisis. Uh, if you didn't notice, I failed. But I did do a lot of studying and I learned a lot, and it's amazing how little has changed in 30 years. Um, I started speaking on peak oil in, in 97, and to anyone that would listen, and that wasn't a whole lot of people back then, it was a very new idea. Um, but uh, there were some audiences. Gas was $1.23 a gallon. There didn't really seem to be a problem there. I remember reading articles from economists that said if there were any scarcity of oil, it would be showing up in a price signal. Okay, I think we passed that milestone. Um, but the objective at the time was just to educate people, right? To bring them up to a certain base level of knowledge that they were going to need. Uh, and, and that was worthwhile. Um, although the, the audiences were small, so I had to rin, li, rinse, lather, and repeat repeatedly. Uh, I mostly spoke at renewable energy fairs and ecological centers. Uh, this is where the audience was, right? Uh, I would have people come and tell me, well, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You need to get out to the other people. I'm like, get them to show up, and I'll do that, right? You can only talk to who will listen, which is very limiting. Um, the audience was and remains mostly gray or bald-headed with a smattering of youth. And if you look around the room here, th this is pretty much the demographic that I see. 
and white. The, the number of people of color that I encountered any of these things is minuscule and way under proportion. I don't know why, I don't know what that means, but it's very observable. Um, the topic draws problem solvers, right? People who have this solution that they want to uh, convince you about. And uh, advocates, right? People who are pushing a particular point of view and idea. And I love the, the introductory talk here about, you know, we have to make room for all of those. So there was this dramatic need for education. Uh, we are not energy literate in this country. Uh, so I actually would start out presentations with a quiz. Uh, so as people would come in and gather, I would hand them out a quiz. It would give them something to do before I actually started talking, before everybody got there, right? And then uh, the answers to the quiz were all kind of smattered through the, the course of the presentation, which helped keep their attention. Uh, and it also let them see how much that they didn't know, and, and I was surprised as I got feedback on this. Most of the U.S. population thinks that we get most of our electricity either from nuclear power plants or from hydro. The real answer, of course, is coal, but that's what you're talking into, right? Um, most of them thought that solar and wind energy would help solve the oil crisis, thinking that we were burning a lot of oil to generate electricity, even though they thought most of it came from uranium or hydro. Right? But they were shocked when I would say, well, we get 2% of our electricity from burning oil. So how will the wind farm solve the oil problem? Pretty simple idea. They just didn't have the basic knowledge to, to see that. And almost no one could compare the size of the latest oil discoveries with our consumption rate. So we see these things in the news about, you know, a new oil field was discovered, and they always have adjectives. It's huge. It's enormous. It's something um, that sounds impressive. But what does that mean? How big is it in any ratio that matters? Uh, and I spent a great deal of my time debunking pleasant delusions. Ideas people had about something that was going to happen that would make this all a non-problem, uh, and so we really didn't need to think or worry about it. Um, and they didn't necessarily have a lot of information about those things, but they, they read something in an article somewhere that convinced them that, you know, it was going to be okay. That's very comforting, isn't it? So the big things that people asked me uh, were, you know, how soon will it happen? And how high will the price of gasoline go? Right? That's how we relate to an oil crisis. What's the price at the pump? We get daily readouts on this, right? As you drive down the road and you look at the price. And as I talked to them and kind of drilled into that, what they really meant was, can I leave this problem for my children? And is it going to be so bad that I actually have to change something? Or can I just kind of tough it through? So at first I would kind of try and answer that. Well, yeah, how high is the price of, of gasoline going to go? And I realized that was, that was a, a trap. Because all they really wanted to know is, is it low enough that somehow I can still afford to do what I'm doing? And there isn't an answer. So I came up with this one. I said, um, supply and demand always match. Now, sometimes there's bad things that happen to cause that. But supply and demand always match. And the economists who have studied this say a 1% drop in supply will cause an increase in prices, something between 4 and 10%, depending on which economist you read. The geologists tell us the post-peak oil supply will decline, something between 4 and 8% a year. So what we can look forward to is prices that raise 16 to 70% per year. And I would dwell on the per year part, right? It's not we're going to a certain price. It's a continual climb. And you know, history has borne this out, right? Gasoline isn't $1.23 anymore. Use of graphs. So for most Americans, math was a bad experience in high school. And they don't want to go back there. Um, but graphs are wonderful ways of conveying what is really mathematical information uh, in a visual form. And one of the things that's important, I think, to impress upon people is exponential growth. What we are asking of the Earth is not to just keep us at a level, but to keep growing and accelerating forever. And when you look at graphs like this, and you could do population, you could do CO2 emissions, you could do, they're all the same curve, right? 
it becomes kind of obvious looking at it that that curve can't extend off to the right infinitely, or even for very long. And so that there's just a, an intuitive obviousness about that that foregoes all the mathematics. Most of you have probably seen this graph. Um, in the solid colors, we have uh, the amounts of oil discoveries in each year through history and projected out into the future. And then the line representing our rate of oil consumption. And it's very obvious that we used to be finding more oil than we're, we were burning, and now we're burning more oil than we're finding. And that's like living off your past income you put in the bank. And it's obvious to everyone's personal experience that can't continue real long. Again, you, don't, you, could, you could take the axes, uh, axis right off this, right? The numbers don't even matter. You just look at the graph, and you can see that widening gap there. And it's obvious it's not sustainable. Now, I do introduce some numeracy. So as long as you stay away from algebra and higher math, people will listen to a few numbers. Not too many. You can, can flood them way too easily. But uh, the key thing I talk about is we're burning oil, burning oil. Right? This is not like mineral resources where maybe we can recycle iron that we've mined from the ground and re we've burned it at 88 million barrels a day. Um, and that's about 32 billion barrels a year. OK, that's just a number. What does that mean? Well, it's important if people are swayed by what they're reading in the newspaper about, well, yeah, there's this new big oil find. So the largest oil fields discovered in the last 30 years are each less than a year's supply. That just changes the whole discussion. Oh, but we're finding more oil. We can't be running out. We're finding more. Yes, but we're burning it much faster than we're finding it. That's what the graph showed. This is the numerical uh, representation of that. So, you know, the tuppy field off Brazil, this was huge. This is gargantuan. For some reason, that one was in the news a whole lot, right? Because they didn't really expect to find oil there. So it was just this dramatic news event. And, you know, they estimate it's, it's five to eight billion barrels. And that's really good news for Petrobras and its investors. But it's, it's a quarter of a year. In, in terms of the peak oil discussion, it, it, it's a non-event. Uh, we were, had a period where ethanol was the, the great bright hope. We kind of jumped from one to another, right? That there's, there's always a, a new uh, savior uh, coming down the road. And uh, ethanol is uh, certainly one of them. And you know, what I point out is, is we're now using 30% of the entire corn crop in the United States to produce ethanol. And that's giving us 7.7% of our fuel. OK, that's nice. But that means if we converted all the corn grown in the entire country into ethanol, we could supply a quarter of our fuel supply. Should we do that? Shouldn't we do that? You, know, you can have huge discussions about ethanol. But the point is, it doesn't get us out of the peak oil predicament. Little numeracy there, right? It's obvious we can't convert all our corn to ethanol. Not a, not a practical uh, approach, and that doesn't even get you there. Tar sands up in Canada, right? Vast, that enormous, huge, vast, right? That, this will solve our problems. Um, this one I approached a little differently. Rather than getting into the numeracy of it, it's really a question of uh, at what cost. And not in dollars, it's, it's what are we doing to the environment there. And since most of the people I'm speaking to are environmentalists, this works pretty well. Um, so you know, we've got these huge open pit mines employing the largest mining equipment made in the world to mine this thick, gooey, sandy stuff. And then we put it in giant vats of hot water, and the oil floats to the top. And we skim that off, and it looks like thick syrup, because it's not oil, it's, it's tar which has to be um, processed to make into thinner products. And along the way, we get these enormous tailing ponds from the uh, water that was used that are uh, so enormous they can be seen from outer space. And they're so toxic that the um, migratory waterfowl, if they land in them, they die. And so they surround them with propane cannons to scare away the birds so that they don't land in the toxic tailing ponds. Now, in this process, we're using enormous amounts of natural gas, so enormous that they're now uh, planning to build nuclear power plants on top of the tar sands to supply the heat to boil the tar. The absurdity kind of becomes apparent, OK? Um, and, and so suddenly, tar sands vastness doesn't sound like such the savior that it would if you just looked at the numbers. 
So in this case, I went to the photographs to illustrate what does this really mean? What are we talking about? Because it's far away uh, in hinterlands that we don't think about, and you know, it's another country. And then I would conclude my talks with dire predictions, right? Oil will become scarce. Uh, fuel substitutions will increase the demand for all sources of energy. We'll be less affluent. We'll be less mobile. Uh, but, you know, those of us in the United States, the wealthiest nation, are probably not going to starve or freeze in the dark. But parts of the world will suffer hunger, famine, and war, and die off. I got some negative feedback on this. People didn't uh, really like uh, the scary message. Uh, I was told that, you know, stories should have happy endings. You need to end with hope. And I realized our whole culture is conditioned from television that all problems are resolved in 30 to 60 minutes. An hour and a half it's, if it's a real epic. Um, so I was counseled to end with something hopeful, and I resisted that message for a long time. I said, look, this is a dark problem. I'm going to present it as a dark problem, but eventually they wore me down. So I made up a fairy tale. My fairy tale looked like this. I said, it's time for a new Green Deal. What if we just gradually, over time, replaced every car in the country with a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or an all-electric vehicle, and now they even exist? I mean, I was saying this before they existed, you understand. Um, and then we would generate all the additional electricity those would require uh, through wind farms and perhaps solar, and we'd have to build some additional transmission towers to get that power to where it's needed. Could we do that? What would it cost? And I thought when I launched this that the price would be so exorbitant that you'd realize that this was hopeless, but it actually didn't turn out that way. So it made a very nice fairy tale. Uh, 250 million registered cars, if we transition those over 25 years, um, we're going to spend, I worked out a lot of detail that I don't have time for here, but you know, it'll cost us something between 120 and $240 billion a year. And since we're spending about that much on oil imports, gee, it actually sounds like a good plan. Now, I had another slide about, you know, we probably can't do it that fast, and, you know, do we have the resources to do it? And, but that's not what they heard. So in the renewable energy areas where I was talking about this, they really liked this idea, right? Uh, change had to come as long as I didn't question the future of cars. Um, you know, that was a good thing. They each had their own idea about solutions, and they loved the new Green Deal. This, this was the hope that they had wanted to hear. Here's a terrible problem. Here's a solution. It's already underway. And they're going to wait for it to happen. I didn't destroy complacency. I reinforced it. They can't build an electric car. They can't build a, a wind farm. So they'll wait for people to do that and, you know, hope that works out. They were very pleased. It was a nice story. Now, then I uh, made the mistake of speaking to some uh, more general audiences, people who were not necessarily uh, uh, renewable energy-minded, uh, environmental, or, or any other particular persuasion, and they were less sympathetic. That's an understatement. Um, from their perspective, optimism is good for the economy. Don't you know pessimists are the cause of recessions? And doomsdayers are always wrong, and they cause problems. And I was even accused of being an unwitting shill for the oil companies. So this goes back to my first point. Know your audience, right? If you're speaking to the choir, it's a very different discussion than if you're speaking to the general public. And you're going to have to calibrate your message to that very strong. I made small adjustments to my message, right? No, it's a whole different talk talking to the general public than the self-selected uh, people interested in the topic. So, lessons learned. Um, first of all, the audience size is proportional to the recent increase in the price of oil. I see this over and over again. Record-breaking audiences in 2008, right? Uh, a, a place where Tim and I would do the same talk year after year. We'd have 30 people, 50 people. As price of oil started going up in 205, 206. 50 people, 60, 100 people, 2008, 350 people. 2009, 50 people. 
it's really that direct. Um, you have to tailor your message to your audience. I talked about that. Uh, people will believe almost anything that suggests they don't have to change their lifestyle. So there was a news story that went around about a deal uh, where they had a poultry slaughtering plant and they were going to convert the chicken fat into biodiesel, all of which is true. It's wonderful. I'm glad they're doing it. It's infinitesimal in terms of the impact on the oil situation. But I got more people email that story to me than anything else that happened. It's kind of, well, what about this? I mean, we never thought of it. See, new solutions will just sprout from the ground everywhere around us, uh, you know. Um, a vision that doesn't require individual action won't produce any. Green New Deal, it's coming. Hey, here's a vision. Yeah, that's a nice vision. Okay, I'll wait for that. You got to give people something to do. Um, almost no one is going to make dramatic changes in their life because they heard a good presentation. It doesn't feel like that sometimes. You come down off stage and people run up to you with their questions. Oh, that was so amazing. And, you know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do this. And you'd see them the next year. And how's that going? Oh, well, other things came up. And, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in the moment. It's another thing to change your life. Um, fear can provide motivation somewhat if it's not overdone. Um, but only if it's coupled with a vision and an action plan. If you just kind of make people vaguely afraid, the natural psychological response is to just block that out. They'll dwell with them very briefly and go away. So a few uh, suggestions humbly submitted to what I know is actually a room full of experts. Um, we need to blast fantasy solutions, but briefly. The more time you spend on it, the more it reinforces the whole thought process around that in their minds. It becomes the topic. Um, plant seeds in people's mind to make them resistant to disinformation that comes inevitably and in quantity. Right? Uh, there's going to be, as things get worse, an enormous amount of blame game that will go on. It's the Arabs' fault. Remember that one from the 70s? Uh, it's the oil company's fault. It's the banker's fault. It's the, right? Well, for peak oil, it's a geological problem. So who are we going to blame for that? There's only so much oil there. We took it all out and we burned it. So, we need to temper our expectations, right? And know that people's actions will become more radical as the situation warrants. As long as they're prosperous and comfortable, why would they change? Well, maybe a little bit around the edges, right? But as that disappears, they'll think back on these things, right? Seeds grow uh, when the conditions warrant it. And then give them something they can do now that's not trivial symbolism. I am disturbed about the number of recommendations uh, that come out there that are um, kind of just feel-good things, you know? Uh, so I kind of made two lists here from suggestions off the internet on how to prepare for peak oil. On the left, we have the trivial. They're, they're mostly good ideas. Um, but you know, inflate your tires to the right pressure, get a tune-up, check your air filter, accelerate slowly. Uh, that's all good stuff, um, and you know you can decrease your fuel consumption a little bit there, and save some money, save some oil, and but that's not going to change the world. Uh, then on the right side we have the doomsday scenarios. We need to get flashlights and batteries, store water, food, get a wood stove, buy gold and silver, buy guns and ammo, plant a garden, have a party because it's hopeless. <laughs> but when I look out there, the message is really that polarized there isn't much that's in the middle. Uh, it's, it's kind of these two extremes, like so many other things in our, our national discussions. Uh, and I think the middle ground here is, is what, as, as advocates, we really need to find for people. So uh, this is the simplest one I found, and people do pay some attention to this. We can cut our fuel consumption in half if we simply switch the cars we buy from the four, three models here that are the most popular, the most sold cars in America, 
to the ones that are the highest fuel efficiency. And we don't have to give up our whole lifestyle. We just have to switch the car we buy. That's not too radical, right? That's that middle ground. It's not trivial, but it's not changing your whole lifestyle. It's not, you know, get rid of your cars and ride a bike through the snowstorm. And, and I think in the near term, that's probably the biggest thing we can get people to do, and it has a long-term effect because cars last a long time. So what can you really hope to accomplish in a speech? Very few people are going to go home and change their lifestyle and make tremendous personal sacrifices because you gave an inspiring, stirring speech, no matter how good you are. Few people will, here and there. Ones who were, were ready, they were almost at that point, right? You nudged them over, but not too many. Um, but what I think we really can accomplish is preventing counterproductive behavior as things get bad, as things get worse, as things start happening, and we get into this blame game situation. You know, during the gasoline price spike of uh, 2008, the, the number one recommendation out of uh, kind of Washington and the policy establishment was, well, let's rescind the gasoline tax. Because the problem is gasoline is too expensive, so we'll cut the tax and the price will drop by that much. They were missing the whole problem, right? That wasn't going to help uh, the problem. That was, in fact, going to make it worse. This is the sort of counterproductive thing I'm talking about, that you know, we're going to do all the wrong things if we don't know what the problem is in the first place. And that's why the, the basic education is important.